Welcome to Laptop Radio. Today's topic is empowering artists through visual technologies and blockchain economics. And we have William Bear HRC with us. Hello, William. How are you? I'm doing amazing today, and I'm super excited to talk to you about this topic and this new industry that I'm really, really proud of being a part of. So thank you so much. I'm grateful for being on the show. William is working with me on a VR platform called MetXR. William, before we go into talking about empowerment of artists, tell us your story. Hey, so a little bit about me. I come from New York. I was born and raised in the city. I went to a college in Washington, D.C. And then after I got into real estate, working in real estate allowed me to work in commercial real estate, commercial properties, which I started reviewing a lot of the financial documents of art. And some of them were tech companies. And I noticed that there was a lot of interest and demand in it. At the same time, Consensus, which is the main Ethereum holding company or backing company when it comes to a lot of the spokes that are built on it, is taking place in my neighborhood in Brooklyn. So I quickly became ingrained in that. And I came out to San Francisco to pursue my dream. I have gone to school, became a full stack software engineer and blockchain developer. And Mm -hmm. my focus is VR and visual immersive kind of experiences for people of any kind, right? Like I'm not trying to only make things for high-end devices. My specialty is trying to make it accessible on mobile phones, on Androids, on desktops, as well as in VR. Mm -hmm. When the topic is about empowering artists, there is an NFT revolution, almost a renaissance of art. And certain social constructs today, artists do not make a lot of money. And they're usually super poor, even though they're talented. Money goes to people who work with money, such as lawyers and Wall Street people and CEO of different companies. For the first time in history, there seems to be a shift. What does that mean? And what does empowerment mean to artists? I love the term that you use, Michelle, is uh, revolution and uh, renaissance. Because I think that every time that we have some sort of new economic medium or mode, we're mm-hmm. able to have a renaissance of art. We were able to have a revolutionary technology called the Gutenberg printing press. And then we had the renaissance of art and, and all the birth of it because of communication and worldwide communication. You know, A lot of people don't understand why the Mona Lisa is so famous. It's not because of that piece of art, it's because it was stolen from the museum. And it was reported in all the newspapers in the world. And this was the first time the entire world saw a piece of art in the papers. And because of that, it became everlasting fame. So the idea of being able to widely communicate is that the internet has given us. And now that we're all connected, we still can't have this layer of trust Artists still weren't able to speak to industry or speak to investors in the way that startup founder could. They have private shares and certain types of legal frameworks and and other types of things. But now with the power of blockchain technology, these artists are able to generally solicit amazing amounts of capital from the open market for their goods and be able to give them a receipt that that has happened and it's just going to wildly change those that are controlling like the economies. I mean, look at Beeple. He's able to already bring in close to $100 million from his art. And he's just getting started in terms of what he's going to release. So like, there's going to be museums and schools dedicated to artists in the future. And they're going to be able to change our economy the same way that we've seen tech founders and other CEOs of industry do in the past. And I think that's exciting. I think when we talk about artists, it's a metaphor because that include people who make music. That include people who do crafts. During the Renaissance, during the time of the printing press, it brings ideas to the rest of the world like it never did before. I always believe that art is a reflection of society. It talks about society. And the fact that there is a revolution or a renaissance 
really tells us that we're ready for society to change, that we're ready for a revolution. So what does that mean? What is a revolution? The revolution is coming fast. We're not going to have so many sequels. We're not going to have so many things that are green lit by the studios, things that are so well planned out. Artists will be able to fund what they're doing from what they're doing, from their own artistic clarity of it while the project's being created and then after as well as align interest together with their team so they'll be able to form and collaborate with stronger and more incentivized and more motivated tribes. I mean, this is a level of organizing. So the way I think about APIs as a software engineer, I love APIs. I love being able to control different types of information and different types of software with APIs. And what I would say is that money is the API for humans. When we're able to now organize humans through the scalability and the understandability of smart contracts with different types of incentive money parts, people will be able to attract a graphic designer for your movie immediately. You'll be able to put out a bounty that says, hey, I need an editor that will be able to do this. I need a VFX person that can do that. I need all of these different things. And the team and the tribe will be able to come together, collaborate on it. And then once it's released, they all know that they'll get a piece of it. Not only is it individually empowering, it's also empowering us to be able to team up and take on the future together, which I think is so, so important. Do you mean that for once, someone could work with the artist directly and they will be compensated fairly? And the middle people, do we need them anymore? Or are we still going to collaborate with them? I don't want to scare all the intermediaries, but peer-to-peer -peer does mean peer-to-peer. -peer. Find a way to add value to the system, and you will be compensated with the correct amount of value, which is more than what you think it is. So that's the advice I would give to all these intermediaries, because yes, we will not need them as much. Their leverage is shrinking. The artists are more empowered. But at the same time, if the industry is able to aggregate a ton of different people and organize a ton of different people in the right ways and offer fair deals within the web 3.0 frameworks it'll be a part of the the equation as long as people want them there and that's the real thing is that with blockchain we already have that third party that third witness that can make sure that everything goes how we say it will so that we can form agreements and then once those agreements are formed the, the money will be dispersed the way it say it will the the contract will be executed the way it will like all of those things will occur so we don't necessarily need a big brand or a big company or a big industry simply to ensure just that however if that big brand or company is giving us their value we will respect that too i think all humans can participate in this revolution please come over please do right intermediated people and and use your networks and use your contacts for good gain hard skills and be a part of this revolution what is web3 technology and how is that different from web1 and web2 web1 was really individualized servers you ran your server at home and you were able to connect to another server with someone else. If you wanted a website, you hosted it on your computer and you kept your computer connected to the internet and online. And if someone gave you a phone call, your website was down. And that was web one. And then a lot of different companies found out that if they decided to host it for you and decided to have really good Wi-Fi and great power and good computers, that you would give them your content and they would display it to others on your behalf. And then we saw that become more and more user friendly from WordPress to Facebook. There's all these different ways that you can give your content to a larger company and then they can display it to other people on your behalf. That's a more centralized mode of operating on the internet. The internet always finds a way to fix itself in my opinion, because it has so many minds looking at it from all different places and all the time. Web three is kind of directed at that core problem by giving a new sort of platform where miners are incentivized already to operate a massive supercomputer that exists all over the world that anyone can access with the proper burning of that token or that coin. And what this can also do is it can help us make important decisions. Decisions that we usually think are important enough for 
C-level executives and other types of people who run companies. Think about all the value, all the markets, all the businesses that are based off of Bitcoin alone or Ethereum alone. If it was a company listed on the stock exchange, it would have value. People would be buying and trading the stock. Yet there's no CEO of this company. There's no CMO. There's no board or anyone that really sits at the top of this entire structure because it's all this framework of decentralized equations. I would like to think of it more as a democracy running a business rather than what we used to see as the CEO of monarchies that existed in our past private sectors. Breaking apart these monarchies and these centralized systems and replacing it with things that look more like a public service or public utilities is what we're going to see. We're going to see a company that looks a whole lot like Uber, but 99% of the money will go directly to the driver and 1% will go to an insurance or, or something like that, where it's just more of a way to set up how the revenues are allocated that we all agree on, rather than it being a company that has the burden and responsibility of doing that and the opportunity of exploiting profit from the users. Usually when people talk about artists, they don't talk about value. They don't talk about money. Mm -hmm. Usually people just want them to work for free. What does it mean and how does blockchain economics play a role in artists' lives today, especially with NFT and what is NFT? A non-fungible token, NFT, is a way to package things online and have agreement and communication with others in a serious way. What I hate about the situation that you described, where art are not empowered through the economy, is very true. And we all agree that that's the certain scenario. I mean, to the point where we even poetically refer to them as starving artists and put even that on a, a pedestal. When To me, that's so inhumane. To me, if you want to make artifacts, you have to start with art. This is how humans will make mark not only to each other and to themselves and express themselves, but how we express ourselves to the universe and to other observers in the future or in the past. Like you never know how this art will be able to reverberate. There's all sorts of things that we need to incentivize more people to do. And I think being creative is by far on top of the list. So not only will this empower the current level of artists and help them make more economic decisions, I think that if all the artists that are doing work every day and releasing these NFTs and are selling it great, if they decide to help others and build out more educational things and build out things that and try to change things in the society that they see is wrong, I think mm -hmm. they're going to make a greater effect than what the current Wall Street guys are doing with their profits and their money. We can choose who's making a lot of capital in this economy. Why don't we choose it to be those that are empathetic and create art that we love? I think that allowing them the tools to make their own niche economies and niche markets where their fandom can play within the imagined economy and the imagined world that they can have and making that real in terms of capital, in terms of value to others and fungible to other economies and interchangeable to other places. I mean, that is very, very powerful for all of us. I'm really excited about what we're gonna see when artists start becoming the most powerful people in our societies and how much value they decide to reverberate and all of the butterfly effects that, that occur. And I know you love butterflies because I keep seeing it in your art. And that's why I love working with you because artists are amazing people to work with because they like to think about things in very creative ways. They love solving problems and they always have a unique perspective. And I think we need to encourage that more because I don't think is a person who is an artist or isn't an artist. They're just people. And people can become artists. You can become more creative. And that's what I think is going to happen. I really think that this NFT thing is going to help schools and universities say, wait a second, maybe we don't need them studying all of this stuff. We need them making more graphics. We need them doing this. This kid needs to make money. He needs to learn how to make more Fortnite skins and learn how to do digital shoes and all of this other stuff that you and I know is the future. And I think it's coming fast. I was talking to someone and, and they, they just couldn't believe it. They just couldn't believe this renaissance. They thought that it's fake, just like they thought COVID is. And when they sell their first piece until they really get the money, they don't really believe that it's real. And it's almost so weird mm -hmm. to even feel that because there's a long history 
of undercompensation. So now it's almost unbelievable. It's almost amazing. It really is. I think that they're getting what they earn. And that is a whole lot more food than they thought it was because they were tied to all of their life. It's also kind of cool that artists are going to be rich. So it's like, okay, mom, being an artist was the right thing to do. Maybe the teenagers had a point. So uh, I really want us all to win. And I love mom. Don't get me wrong. Like she's right about a whole lot of things, but they lived in a different world in a different time. And now this is showing that the time is changing. Human art is the most valuable thing. I mean, when you look at everything that sells to you, it's all well-designed. And if what is designed, if not an artistic way of looking at a product, what is designed, if not an artistic way of looking at a user experience, you go on websites, everything needs art. There's art layered upon art, layered upon art on a base level of art. Even when we're coding, we need more colors for our different like <laughs> functions and like visual studio code looks like a candy store to me. We need art in every second of every day. Being able to satisfy that need and being able to be valued for it. I think is what we're going to do because now that this art is rare and not everyone can own it, there are going to be some people who are going to want to. And look, mm -hmm. if you don't want to own an NFT, that's fine, but someone will. That's the coolest thing is that I got to convince these artists and other people that when they want to jump in, you don't need to convince everyone that your art is awesome. You just need to convince two bidders. That's it. Two people in the entire space, if they both want your piece, they will bid each other up and you'll be able to be very happy with that situation. I'm, I'm just super pumped as well as there's empowerment beyond that. Like you will be able to power from the secondary sales of that. That's kind of cool that you can have that conversation with the investor too, where you can say, hey, when you make a bunch of money off of my art and you sell a lot more, I need 5% of that. I need 7% of that. You're able to ask them and have this conversation written out in a trusted medium that they take you seriously and you can take them seriously. So that's what's awesome is that we've had this internet where we couldn't take each other seriously. Like we just couldn't, like you can't trust people on the internet. But now that we have blockchain, you can trust everyone. You can trust anyone with any amount of money at any time because it's all programmed, all protected in smart contracts. And your money is smart. It's not going to let itself lose itself if you programmed it correctly. By the way, this is not financial advice, but I'm just saying that the idea of Web 3.0, having your money's back and the blockchain protecting your money so that you're not worried about it, will now open up the ability of you to be able to allow people to take out money. And I don't want to get too deep here, but one of the best ways that I see what I'm talking about in reality is through the form of flash loans that you DeFi where people have literally staked billions of dollars that anyone can take out with, from without a credit check, with no data, no identification other than their own wallet. And they can borrow that money at very, very low interest. The banks would cry at these levels as long as you pay them back within the same contract. If you can prove to them in a contract that you're going to make more money with their money, you get to keep all the profit, you come back the interest rate, these are great, serious conversations that you can now have with the market and with capital that we couldn't have before. So I'm so excited about the serious conversations that artists are now being able to engage in. But I think we're all going to be able to engage in serious conversations with each other. And that's going to be the most powerful thing. As an IP and licensing attorney, when we license technologies, we have different kinds of royalties. And depending on how it is structured. Everyone's been talking about smart contracts and how awesome it is. And in the art world, not only do you make money from the first sale, you also get royalties like you should when other people buy it because you are the creator. Why do people trust smart contracts? And why is that even better than an agreement? It is an agreement. It's an agreement backed by technology. I always like to say that money talks. What smart contract does is it basically gives money the microphone. And it says to you, hey, yo, like, I can't really enforce any laws. I'm not a governmental entity. But if you put money into the smart contract, I will be able to allocate that money or disperse it in different ways according to the contract. It allows the money to have a conversation with us in a way that we directed it to. It allows money to become a third party between the peer to peer, which I think is awesome. It can do that through different scenarios, such as the NFT. If I sell an NFT to an investor for one ETH, 
And then they go off and they flip it for 13 ETH. And I say to the investor, hey, when you bought it at one ETH, you saw the smart contract, you were disclosed all of this information, I'm supposed to get 5% of that secondary sale. Now, instead of how in traditional world, uh, sending out a letter, talking to them, <laughs> trying to get it from them and actively, in some cases, litigate and have to collect, which as a lawyer, you know, even sometimes when you have a judge saying that you have right to collect, sometimes even then the collections don't go through. The system doesn't even work when it's on your side sometimes. And so the blockchain will immediately not even let them touch the money. The money will go directly to your wallet. You don't have to have that conversation. That's the really cool thing about smart contracts is it becomes that trusted medium that we're able to have a serious conversation together. And that conversation, because it's serious, it means something and it means something to the money and the money will listen to that contract. I love the idea of being a part of each other and growing together because that 5% could motivate that artist to retweet your purchase. Let's say you bought an NFT from a popular artist at one ETH and they're out there selling it and you're looking at your wallet and it's worth three ETH, but you're like, yo, the piece I bought was extra special, man, like da, 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 and you hit up the artist and the artist knows that they're going to make money when you sell it. He might retweet it, get it more notoriety, and now it sells at a higher price and yeah. he's incentivized to do that, where in the past he might've just been like, Nah, dude, I, 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 I cashed the check. Goodbye. Like I'm working on my next project. I don't have time to talk to you. Being able to have that serious conversation helps set up a relationship together that you guys are incentivized. I keep going back to that part of the blockchain, which is that it allows us to build tribes more organized, more readily available, more quickly, because the only thing that businesses are is people. And being mm -hmm. able to organize and get together as people is our most powerful trait. That's what separates us completely from non-societal like animals is that we were able to form cities and form civilizations and work together in different tribes to achieve bigger and bigger goals. Oh my God. I mean, we're pouring gasoline on a fire right now because the internet has connected us so crazy, so immensely, so deeply. And now we'll be able to do bigger and bigger things through the chain, look at what Reddit is begging to do right now. With Wall Street Bets, imagine them empowered with the knowledge of smart contracts. Imagine them empowered with the ability to pool their money and stake into different endeavors and go after different situations because they're as smart as the smartest one among them. The smartest user on there can show them all the evidence and show them what's going on. And then they all get hit to it. And now they all can operate in coordination. And being able to form that tribe is super powerful as the large hedge funds had seen with these people who basically had a $600 stimulus check. But mm -hmm. being able to operate in sync and in cohorts is actually putting up a fight. And that's insane because they're truly a David against a large Goliath. And I think this type of thing is happening because of internet technology and blockchain is the perfect accent to that connection because now that we're connected, we can have more serious conversations and that will allow us to become hyper incentivized and hyper connected even more to achieve bigger and bigger goals. The topic is empowering artists to see digital technologies and blockchain economics. What are some of the visual technologies that are relevant to artists today? When people are talking about blockchain, they usually talk about exchanges, they talk about coins and tokens or protocols, and usually the focus is really not on artists. So mm -hmm. what are these visual technologies? My grandfather, he's great at business. And he would always tell me, he said, William, the way you can run a good business is first you get their eyes then you get their bodies, then you get their wallets. You have a big sign, make a big statement, best burger in town, make a huge claim, make, get something that gets their eyes, right? Because only then will you get their bodies. Now they're in your store, now you're talking. And now that they're there and ready, now you charge them, you can get their wallet. So the visual part is the most important part because that's how you like get the school of fish. That's how you get the people to break apart from where they were going and now play into your universe and play into your burger shop. And so visual art and visual attention grabbing to me is by far completely more elevated in this economy and this new world because we have a low cost of goods. Let's face it, it's digital. There's no way a digital Louis Vuitton bag 
is going to be the same amount of cost in terms of leather, in terms of metal zippers, in terms of the cost to logistics, the driving to get it together, the factory to run it, the rent, the people, and so much cost that comes with making physical goods, that digital goods has such a low cost that it's going to be about the attention game. It's going to be about who has the market's attention. Being visual and being in the, in the field where you have that attention grab, that is by far the most leveraged right now, I think, in the future. And it's only going to grow in power in terms mm -hmm. of this new economy. And that's why I'm working. I don't like to plug myself too much. I haven't really talked a lot about MedXR on this interview, but I'd love to talk about why we're using visual technologies because of its attention grabbing nature and ability to keep people on the site longer. So we have a new form of 3JS and web frameworks that allows us to build 3D spaces. And we're building these NFT museums with it. And we feel like a static page that's selling NFTs is great. And we love all the marketplaces and we love and want to support the entire NFT space. We feel like our niche is where we want to offer a more immersive and more visually appealing and visually grabbing website for people to access. And that's what we're doing over at medxr.com. We're hanging NFTs right now. We're being able to put people into a digital museum. It can run from your phone. It can run from your desktop, but it was designed and meant for VR. So the optimum way to use it is with an Oculus 2 and using a Firefox browser going directly to the site. There's no software to download on any of these devices, including your browser or phone, and there's no login. So you're just able to click on the link, come right in, and you can see the NFTs that are up for auction immediately inside of an immersed site that's going to captivate your attention for longer than what we think a static site would. That's my play on visual, and that's why I think that the visual world is going to attract the buyers into an economy. The entire products are, are all commoditized, and they're all about the same cost of goods. So the differentiating is going to be the attention and who we're paying attention to. Awesome. I think VR and XR, including AR, as an AR artist. Is Absolutely. That, is that it's very dynamic. It's not just flat and it provides different angles. You, you can play music in there. You, there's just a lot more creativity that you can provide and a whole immersive experience when you're looking at art. Exactly. And also in this thing, we put in the ability to form tribes and communicate with each other. The buyers and the bidders and the whales can now talk to each other about the artist and we're not censoring any of it. They can say anything that they want to each other in the room. And if you don't like what someone's saying, you can walk away from that conversation. And if you do like something or you overhear something, you can walk towards it. Just like in the real world, we mm -hmm. wanted it to be very natural. So we had ambient dynamic sound that Honestly, that was really, really awesome that we got working because it made it feel way more like you were in a real museum, a real gallery with other people. And the idea of other people can make people feel FOMO, fear of missing out on a good deal. It can make people feel like these artists are loved and cherished by other buyers. There's so much things. Also, they can talk about what they love in art in general, give feedback to artists, we're all talking about being able to create new NFTs in the 3D world where the artists could be collaborating with each other or with their buyers as to different things that they want to see in their art and want to purchase and mint. So there's so many possibilities now that we're living in a metaverse with capabilities that are high poly. Our website has better frameworks and better FPS and better poly counts than anything that I've seen so far, because I believe NFTs are valuable and they need to be seen and downloaded and cherished at that resolution. We're going to try to keep pushing the envelope there. Hey, William, what is your favorite museum? My favorite museum is the Metropolitan Museum. Also, the History Museum in New York, the one near Central Park. Yeah, the Great Stuff oh. Animal Museum. Yeah. How do you feel when you're in there? Do you usually go with your friends or do you go alone? I, I go with my friends. I mean, I'm from New York where the museums are free and they're yeah. there. And especially on a hot day in the summer, they're air conditioned. So we would always go to the museums nonstop. 
The Museum of Natural History was amazing. And as a kid, they would have tour guides. You'd learn, we'd learn something every time. And also I would love, it was my favorite thing in the world. I spent so much money on it. These freeze dried astronaut ice creams that they <laughs> only had at the museum. I could never find anywhere else. It was $4 or something crazy for one of them. They were small, but it was like, I never had that flavor or that freeze dried ice cream anywhere else, but that was awesome. But yes, no, museums are like a temple of holiness to me. I've, I love science museums as well. Yeah. I remember the science museum, the first time I ever saw cow's eye get dissected. Oh, I loved it. It was the best. Yes, they had a cow's eye dissection. I was eight years old. I was really young and it was the most interesting <laughs> thing I've ever seen. After that, I wanted to go into biomedical engineering and I ended up helping out Dr. Cunningham on the, the sickle cell anemia project using embryonic stem cells. And I think the moment that I wanted to get into biomedical engineering was that moment in that universe, in that science museum. So I owe a lot to it, but yeah, no, I'm not in bio anymore. I'm in tech now, but like, <laughs> it's definitely quite a journey that was sparked by that imagination. I love museums. The idea of being able to have that kind of, even, even if I can get one-tenth of what I experienced in a museum and share that on a scalable medium like the internet where people can just jump in and learn mm. something or see something they haven't seen before or experience some or meet somebody they don't know before or talk about, express themselves and talk about their opinions. Like there's so much amazing things that we can happen when we build a community around visual, amazing technologies. So it's awesome. What's so cool about digital museums or XR, VR museums is that you can actually talk to people because if I was a museum, I'll try to be quiet and because there's always guards in front of the door. You couldn't talk really loudly because you're supposed to be really classy. Yeah, we built uh, virtual cameras that could be in the museum and I thought no one would use them. You could take a screenshot of the museum if you want, you know, like why would you need a virtual camera? People love taking selfies of their avatars standing next to yeah. each other in front of things. I feel like being able to have that 3D, we communicated to them that it's a real space. And once they believed that it was a real space, they wanted to do real things. They wanted to take selfies. They wanted to hang out with each other. They wanted to experience art and express themselves. Like it's an amazing thing. And I'm so grateful and happy to help provide a platform for people to have a real community and real experiences in. It's the best feeling ever. Yeah, I'm super excited because you can have different kinds of art. You can have a science piece in it or a natural mm -hmm. history piece or a fashion piece. And you can create different immersive rooms. And we're creating custom too, Michelle. It's amazing. I love, love, love what you're saying here because we want to work with as many different people. If you guys are hearing this anywhere in the world, please, please reach out to us because we can do whatever you're into. If it's very cool, if it's going to help the world, if you're very passionate about it, then that's something that we want to be involved with. So yeah, it could be fashion. It could be a basketball court. It could be any kind of things. We could be racing cars. Like it could be anything, any type of art, any type of design through this medium and be able to have a real community there. I think is amazing. So I love, by the way, I love psychedelics. I think that there should be like a shaman room in there that people would be able to go in digitally and meditate and be able to form communities and form things that's in like a big playa desert that looks like Burning Man. We should definitely be able to fill out our imaginations and have that context around us to form stronger communities and engage in better niches. Yeah, I was just thinking about Vegas and just all the icons buildings of the world just could be in one place and that would be awesome because we could have mega city fans. yes and mega city that every skyscraper awesome. let's do yes. it i love that skyline yes. let's build it and things that fly in the air have since mars and <laughs> you know anything absolutely hey if anyone listening if you could comment an idea or something that we put into this space we're going to go through these comments. I'm going to read. I'm very interested in what you will react to. I'm going to try to put some of this stuff in there because I love to include more and more ideas in this. And I think Mega City is happening. We are building this multiple skyscraper city with things flying through the air. 
absolutely, Michelle, let's do it this week. Let's make it happen. I'm such a futuristic. And is there anything that you wanted to share that I have not asked you? I want to just tell people to get into the game. I know that everyone's looking at these big prices in the NFT space. They think that they're not famous enough to make money in the NFT space. And I will say that it's not about being better. It never was. It's all about being different. And I'm not trying to get sued by Apple by taking their tagline here, but I'm just saying that at the end of the day, differentiating yourself from all the other websites is what's going to make you win. It doesn't matter if you're selling used books online. You could become the biggest company in the world doing a digital medium and being able to communicate people and having serious conversations. Whenever I say serious, I mean money. Whenever there's money involved, I get real serious. That's what I mean by serious conversations is like someone was trying to sell used books online. And back then, they didn't even understand credit cards that well. PayPal was a big deal because websites just weren't able to understand payments. So now that the internet has its own native system, and now that this native system is completely separated from any semblance of it to the point where it's hard to onboard people a little bit, it's very powerful new world. And I think that it's going to be much bigger than Web 2.0. And I want people to be a part of it in any shape or form. There's a famous thing where you buy a bond for a baby. When someone has a wedding shower or baby shower or something like this, please don't buy gifts, buy them Bitcoin, buy them Ethereum. This is not financial advice, but I love the idea of gifting crypto to other people at an early age or in a way that they don't even get to access it for a while or something like this. Maybe don't even give them the private keys or something like this for a couple of years just to give them that Total, yes, the price will go down, but maybe the price will go up. We're in it for the long term kind of thing because I think that having a bond approach to the market could set up generational wealth. So yeah. that's one thing that I would say is like a lot of kids think that Bitcoin is boring or Ethereum is boring. So get them a cool NFT. To give them an NFT that they think is the coolest NFT ever that they're going to cherish and not going to want to sell anyway. And there's so many awesome ones out there. I think even the search for it is valuable. So like, even at the end of the day, you guys don't actually buying it or going through with it, which I hope you do. I really hope you do. But just searching together, looking through the metaverse, looking, looking through the 3.0 verse is very, very powerful. And yeah, speaking to the metaverse, definitely think through the next version of what websites can look like. I'm sick of chat rooms. I'm sick of texting. It feels too much like homework. <laughs> You know, what? like so much reading, so much writing. We're writing term papers every day just to say what's up. Like, how was your day? Oh, it was cool. Da, da, da. All this stuff is paragraphs that we're just texting. Like, I'd rather just talk to you. Rather than just walk up to you and say, hey, how's it going? That's cool. Let me bring in this 3D object. Let me show you this video. Let me show you this piece of art. Let's listen to this music together and I'll see you later. That's the kind of experience I want to have completely digitally, completely online in a 3D way. I really think those two industries are some of the most exciting areas that I want to participate in. And please, please listen to what I say, but watch what I do. Like whatever I'm doing, there's something to it. There's going to be something in it. Please compete with me. Please cooperate with me. I'd love to partner with you, but I'm on to something and you should be too. And this isn't to people, if you're already on to something, if you already have your own thing and it's awesome, that's great. Please just invest a little bit. Sorry, not financial advice. Please just put a little bit of money into crypto in general. But if you're looking for something to do, if you're looking to change your life, if you're looking for something new, please, please, please get into this game, get into the VR game, get into the AR game, put it on the web, web AR, web VR. Please do that also make it accessible, make websites more gamified, play more towards community and engagement and empower people to talk to each other and then bring in the blockchain economy when it makes a lot of sense. Put it on chain when it's serious. When you wanna have a big digital witness, have the nodes witness it, have the miners look at it because you're gonna have to pay them to do all of this. Yeah. There's gas fees for it all, but if it's a serious conversation, those gas fees are nothing compared to what the outcome of your relationship with that new person or that new investor or that new smart contract could be. And then how can people find you? The best way to find me is on Instagram, blockchain broker, 
is the best way. I'm, I'm on Instagram, but I'm also super accessible. I speak in Clubhouse, but please just friend me on Instagram, DM me. I'm also on Telegram, Blockchain Broker, but that's a little tougher because I get so many messages on Telegram. And also check out our website, medxr.com and medxr.org. We bought both of the domains and one will usually have information about it and the other will usually be a live room. Right now I'm thinking medxr.com is going to be a live room. Medxr.org will be the place where you will find more info about the team and our mission and how you can get involved as an artist or as someone who wants to help us with business development or someone who has to help us market. There's so much help that we need that please, please reach out. We want to work with everyone. We want to build tribes. We want to empower every new member of the tribe to unrealistic means. I want to give you guys all the leverage and all the empowerment and basically just make honey empire. I studied political science in college and there's different types of empires. By far the most attracted to is honey empire. It's an empire where you empower everyone in your empire so much. You don't hold any leverage over them. You don't control them so much that if any other threat tries to hurt you, everyone who's empowered by you is going to have your back. And you just try to keep empowering so many other people all the time that your empire just grows. And that's just kind of what we're building here is that methodology. So I'd love for anyone to join. And thank you so much for having me on here. Stanford is such a huge and prestigious medium. I love being able to talk to the great minds. And I really hope that you give us some comments. If you're critical, that's great too. I love feedback. It's not going to hurt my feelings. Please tell me anything you want. And also, if you want to say something awesome and positive, I'd love to hear that too. You don't have to give us improvement or advice. You can just be like, yo, man, that's awesome. And that will make my day. I would love to hear that. Also, advice is great. That's the most valuable thing you can give is something actionable, something that we could take part on where you're like, hey, guys, there's a study that you need to look at or this link that can help you that could be super invaluable. So thank you again for having me on the show. And I'm really excited to, to keep working in this field. Yeah, and I have one last question. Of the course. Last, the last question is for folks who are interested in it and they love what they heard, how do they learn about NFTs and get a MetaMask account? Where do people find resources? There are a lot of places to read about it, but first... DM me and let's do it. You got to do it to know it. And it's a lot easier once you do it. The best way to learn about MetaMask is to download MetaMask. The best way to learn about OpenSea or like being able to mint or go on Rarible or go on Super Rare or go on all these other platforms that are existing and popping up is to find one, apply to a lot of them and, and see if you can get in and mint something. And a great way to try out a lot of this stuff for no pain, but also no reward would be to do it with test, test ether. So there's a lot of play ways that you can use test, test nets, test ether. You can mint your stuff on test nets, see how the technology works. And when you go into it with capital, you'll go in with your eyes wide open and you'll be able to take on the market in a great way. But what I would say is I actually hear stories from artists a lot of times, and it actually comes to us as like a frustrating story because they're usually like, hey, I worked so hard on this most recent piece, but this other piece that I minted just as a test ended up selling for more than my most recent piece that I worked really hard on. <laughs> and I was just like, wow, there are some investors out there that will find your Genesis piece. They want the first piece you've ever minted. They will search you. They will find it out. So it might not happen tomorrow. It might not happen next year, but they will, if you become a famous artist or you growing some notoriety, there is a trend and there will be people that want to get that first piece that you've ever minted. So that's what I'm saying is get it out there, see what happens and get another one out there and another one and another one and another one. It's just like anything else. You got to go to practice. You go to rehearsal and you just get better and better every time you'll be an amazing actor you'll be an amazing athlete as long as we rehearse and practice same thing in the nft space and same thing with all things that we want to do to straight up learn there's a ton of different places that you can learn coin market cap is a place that i read a lot from for the blockchain side but when it comes to nfts i would go on instagram and follow some of the top nft people in the game shout out to television 
I think that he and some of the work that he's doing in the 3D space is such a great role model for people because he doesn't have a blockchain background, but he came in and he's killing it in the game. He's making twenty, thirty thousand dollars off of his NFTs. He's dropping with some of the top rappers and some of the top celebrities in the game now. Major, major props and shout out to television. People puts out a lot of information for artists and people of that nature. I would say follow the artist because artists want to help artists, which goes yeah. back to my earlier point where I'm excited for these artists to be super, super rich because I think they're going to want to help us all. So yeah. let's let's yeah. go. Yeah, there's also NFT Bible as well. And, yes. You know, there's gas fees and made a mouse accounts, but it's minimal. It's, it's actually not that bad. If you're interested in it, just don't be scared away. Just do research and go to Clubhouse rooms where you can ask a lot of questions. I think there's a lot of rooms on NFTs lately. Yeah. And if the course costs a couple of thousand or something, take that money and just try it. Be prepared yeah. to lose a little bit of money doing it. Rather than paying someone, there's so many people out there offering ebooks and PDFs and stuff like that behind a paywall that instead of giving them the money, take it. Yes, read the NFT Bible. That's totally free. Find your free resources and jump in the water and just try it. And yes, you might lose a little bit of ETH here and there, but you're going to class. You know, you're building up the mindset and the muscle memory and the skills to profit in the future. Maybe yeah. it's very powerful. Yeah. Thank you, Will. This is awesome. Oh my God. This has been such a pleasure. I think that we could go on another three hours okay. because we just scratched the surface about what we want to talk about. I just thank you. And I'm grateful to be able to talk with such an amazing mind. And you're such a great person in the blockchain space and in the AR space. I'm really excited for our journey in the past, as well as what we can do to the future. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.